of the world, this is Paper Cuts with Brad and Jay. I'm the one you love. I'm Jay. Thanks so much for stopping by. Over there's Brad. The, it's his show. It's his show. That's why I'm the host, and we just love Jay. Now you know it's all natural. I mean, you know, nothing's rehearsed, right? No, absolutely nothing is rehearsed on this show. God, you just suck the life out of me. It just feels like you've got you've got a lot grayer since we started this. I have. I know. I have. Kick it off a brand new season. Welcome to the program, Mitch Seaborn. We are live. Are we live? I, I kind of forget how to do this, Brad. Uh, I don't. I don't think we are. This is still behind the scenes, so we can like say test. whatever, and, and no one will know. Yeah, it's like test, yeah. test. Are we, are we coming in Tokyo? Hello, hello, <laughs> Tokyo. Yeah. What are Almost. we even doing, Jay? It's dude. I, I, I totally forgot going. how to make that the intro. I, I so <laughs> forgot how to make it earlier. Like, was it yesterday? I said I didn't even remember how to make this intro. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to a brand new season. I don't even know what season we're on, to be honest with you. But we don't keep bringing track of that. <laughs> so seven, eight, nine. I mean, our seasons are like ten or eleven episodes. Yeah, but we don't ever advertise. It's the next season. We just yeah, kind of go new season next. of paper cuts. What's up? It's a new year. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it has been. It's been months. I'm Jay, the one you guys love, and that's Brad over there, um, as usual. Kicking things off, a brand new season, the first episode, you know, we had to make a special, so we reached back into our uh, uh, our old series, our old uh, shows, and grabbed somebody from season one. Mitch Seaborn's <laughs> with us, everyone, and uh, he has a brand new book we're going to talk about. But Mitch, what have you been doing since season one? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, Which has been like three months? No. It's probably, it's probably been like two years ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> when did I we mean, do season one? I forgot. I've been, uh, let's see, working. I've, I've got my law <laughs> license, so I've been doing some law work. I've been doing plenty of teaching, been doing some writing, some, uh, I've been running some races, doing some hiking, um, just enjoying life with my wife. And I don't know, there's a couple of cats running around here that might join <laughs> us here in a minute. So you're, you're making what we did over that time look really pathetic, man. Running <laughs> races, got your I law didn't run license. Any races, no. <laughs> no, I, I may have watched one. I'm not sure. Got your law license. Uh, wow. Yeah. Okay. It's been busy, but I mean, I guess that's a good thing. It is. What kind of what kind of law license did you get? Uh, I finished law school several years ago and got my law license, and I've been over the years juggling uh, practicing law and teaching high school, and you know that's that's an adventure. Either one of those is a full time job. <laughs> So, right. You, you would never know from reading your books that, I mean, they have law and they have teaching. Exactly. <laughs> your, your, your newest one, of course, the sentencing has law and teaching in it. So. it. It does. It's got a lot of both of those. <laughs> it's like, are, are, are we talking about Mitch here? Or are we talking about a different character? <laughs> There's a little bit of me in, um, in several of those characters. Um, you know, uh, I'm I'm not exactly like any of them. Um, I don't have the experiences in most of them, but there's a little bit of me as far as my background and personality and uh, and just about every character I write, except for um, some of the truly bad ones. I prefer to, you know, <laughs> leave myself out of those. But. So when did the sentencing come out? Just like last week or so? Yeah, it, it came out right at the end of December. It's officially uh, out now, right? Okay. <clears throat> I, I wrote that like a year ago and um, entered it into a contest, like a, a novella submission contest. And um, admittedly, I, I enjoyed the challenge of like, I read about this. And at the time that I heard about the contest, I had like a month to get something written and submitted. So um, I try to always put my best foot forward. And I think I did um, as far as I gave myself plenty of time to get it written and edited. And it made it to their like, like it made it past the first round and past the second round. And um, they very politely told me they had gone another direction at the end. So I sat on it for like months, just letting it sit there on my hard drive. And um, then I rewrote it and edited it and added some to it and took a little bit out of it and decided to just publish it. And it came out right after Christmas. I was going to ask if you changed anything from where you submitted yeah. to what it is now. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's um, 
I went back and looked at it and decided, you know, I mean, I like the story. I like the characters and some of it I totally left alone, but um, I wanted to flesh a little bit more of the stuff out. Like um, the, the main characters uh, he's a, he's a retired attorney turned high school teacher <laughs> and his background with um, his son's mother. He never married her, but they maintained a close relationship. And I wanted to put a little bit more of that in there and flesh those characters out a little bit more. So the, the meat and potatoes of the story you had well over a year ago. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So how long did it take you to come up with the actual concept of the story? It was just something you've been floating around for a few years in your head. Actually, no, it's funny how that works because like um, I can sit and think about an idea for a long time and then I go to write it and it's just excruciating and it maybe it doesn't <laughs> even work. Um, but then this thing, I just heard about a submission call for this novella uh contest by a publisher that i've been wanting to submit to anyway and i don't know this idea popped into my head i just kind of came up with the main character and um and i mean i just started writing and ran with it i had just this general idea of okay this guy he loses his son um and this crime gone wrong mm -hmm. and the son ends up um coming back to get some revenge on the man that was responsible for getting them killed. Just kind of a classic, you know, ghostly revenge story. Right. Um, but I thought I can put a unique spin on that um, depending on what I do with the characters. And I didn't outline anything. I knew I had a very tight window to get it written in. And I think I work best like that because almost everything that I end up actually um, finishing and liking is usually either a nano Remo project or something that starts out from a contest or something like this. Okay. So you normally don't outline like big chunks of it or anything? No, no, I don't. Okay. I don't know if you took it uh, as a compliment or uh, anything else, but I, like I couldn't get the feel of Stephen King's The Outsider out of my head while I was reading it. Okay, I can uh, see that. Was that intentional? Was that just subconscious? It really wasn't. I hadn't even thought about that. Um, I guess something about the what. Stephen King was doing there um, is something that also kind of comes naturally to me because one of my books, I think it was folklore. Um, mm -hmm. It was Ross Jeffrey. He told me that um, he told me he had caught a little bit of the outsider in there. And then of course he gave me my props because folklore came out well before the outsider did. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I actually, I remember, I actually rem remember that. Yeah. Yeah. But no, uh, nothing intentional there. It's been years since I've read the outsider and um it, it may be a subconscious thing. Yeah. I mean, I mean, your ending didn't fall off the rails, so yeah. <laughs> it, it's different than, than the outsider. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, not, the, not exactly like, uh, the shape shifting, whatever entity that is, but it's, it was similar. I just got the feeling of it. So, yeah, I was going for a more, um, just kind of classic ghost story here. I wanted, um, I wanted the I love the idea that, OK, maybe there's something supernatural going on. But then again, mm -hmm. maybe there's an interpretation where there's not. Oh. And you just kind of gradually nudge the needle one way. Because I kind of wanted to leave it open here that, you know, maybe this guy isn't being haunted at all. He's just mm -hmm. very, very, very sick and, you know, near the end of his life. Right. But then I wanted to scatter a few details in there that makes you think, no, there was probably a ghost there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I also before the unveiling of of the ghost, and I don't want to give away anything. So I want people to read the actual book, but I, I, I was leaning more towards it being a psychological thriller because mm -hmm. I was questioning: okay, is there an actual ghost or something yeah. there, or is it just in his head because he's now living with all this guilt? Yeah, and 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 then there was a little twist you know and, and then it was the unveiling so hopefully that doesn't give away too much and people still read it but that's yeah. you know i i like how it was just kind of like i'm gonna throw a little curveball in here and go to a certain direction so yeah there's yeah to be clear there, there's very much a ghost in it you yeah. <laughs> you see that you see that ghost in at least one scene so <laughs> yeah i feel like what i have read from you it's been ghost stuff but it's not that there haven't been ghosts in it, like this one has ghosts, but it's been like subtle compared to like other haunt house stories, if that makes sense. Right. Like this one and uh, Dustin Time also, like there was a ghost in that one, but it still felt kind of subtle. 
Mm-hmm. It's not like, it's like boo. It's not like, it's, here's yeah, a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I, I'm not against the in your face stuff at all. But that is a direction I tend to lean towards more naturally. I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Ross has a question. Hey, Mitch, when are we getting more work in the world of folklore and Dustin Time? Can't remember the detective's name now, but I love the crossover stuff. Now, Raleigh, she's in this one. She was in Dustin Time too, right? Ross I was about Sanders. to say and. I didn't see that coming, and that's something that came out when I rewrote this thing. Um, Riley was not in the original at all, but I realized that this story kind of takes place up in that same geographical area. Right. My favorite part of Arkansas is uh, the Boston Mountains, um, just because I'm a mountain person, and that's the closest thing we've got here. But um, I, I love the mountains up in North Arkansas, and I set the story up there. And I thought, well, since our main character's up there, I could um, the story could take place in Hammett's Point, and I could bring Riley back and see what she's been up to. And um, it turns out she's she's working at the school as well now. But yeah, she uh, she's in here too. So there is a little bit of a connection to the folklore and Dustin Tom, um, Dustin Tom world. It was was Hammett's Point also in Dustin Time? I'm horrible mm-hmm. with names. I remember Riley, but I didn't remember the. the yeah, Hammett's show. Point was the town where Dustin Time takes place. Okay. Yeah. So this is a few years after that, I guess, because Riley's in a different position now. Yes. Where yeah. She, now. she kind of left the, um, you know, constable thing behind. Okay. And if, yeah, if you read the book, you discover what uh, her new profession is. <laughs> but she's right. She's in there. Yeah. How many how many books is she in? Is it just the three now? It's the three now, yes. And I really thought I was I was going back and forth with her because after I finished uh Dust and Tom, I immediately wanted to write another book with her in it. Uh-huh. Just because I, I like her character. I didn't I didn't know when I wrote folklore that she would end up being this character I'd write about again. It wasn't uh-huh. a planned thing. Um but I liked her character. I liked how she's good with maps and she knows the lay of the land. And um, she's, she's brave and everything you want in a protagonist, but she's also not like some, you know, superhero or Miss Perfect or anything. Um, And uh, so I wanted to write another story immediately, but I couldn't make it work. And several years have passed now. And uh, it's funny. I got this thing written and then I went back and rewrote it and realized, well, I'm writing about the same place. So I could, I could bring her into it. And uh, so, yeah, it, it was really fun bringing her back into it. That's one of those things that if you over plan stuff, you can miss little opportunities like that. And so how do you feel about writing about in the same place? I mean, is a, is that just something like off your back? Cause you're familiar with the place already, or do you have to feel like you have to bring more things into that place uh, to make it interesting again? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, um, I don't really, like I said, none of this stuff uh, gets planned with me. I just, my the stuff that works best for me, I just sit down and see where the writing takes me. And then I figure, well, I'm going to get this thing done and I'll clean it up when I rewrite it. Yeah. And um, I didn't even know when I wrote this book that I would be writing about Hammett's Point. I sure didn't know Riley was going to be in it. Um, but I realized after I get a few thousand words into something, well, this would work and it would be an opportunity for me to add a little more detail to this world and uh, revisit it again and uh, keep bringing it to life. And, and that's what I did here. Um, So, and I think it's just something that, like I said, it's a place that I know best Mm -hmm. that um, my imagination, ultimately I'll write some stuff that takes place in Colorado or um, cause I love the Rocky mountains, but I always end up coming back to North Arkansas. Right. So we probably won't see anything from you that's taken place in the UK <laughs> or or uh, in Kentucky or Canada or <laughs> Texas. I'm, or <laughs> I'm too, you know, I've done a lot of traveling. Like I grew up in a family that travels and my wife and I, we, we travel and then we travel with her family. And I've been all over this country, been to a couple of different countries, but I'm too afraid to get it wrong if I try to write about that, that, that's what I'm getting at because there's gonna be someone out there like no th- this is yeah didn't you, you spelled that word wrong you know, the it, name exactly. of that word I mean, yeah uh, you know so maybe a scene yeah here or there 
you know, it's not like I'm just mortally afraid to to write about somewhere other than Arkansas or Colorado, the two like states. You, you made that city have three stoplights. It only has two, <laughs> you know? It's, yeah. <laughs> I'll be in um, all Kentucky. I give you permission to set a story in Kentucky if you want to. <laughs> I mean, I might write something that takes place uh, in, you know, uh, Europe or something. If I'm writing something post-apocalyptic and everybody's dead and it doesn't matter anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. I like what Ross said. Riley's your Holly Gibney. Just don't get all weird like King. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, that's interesting, the- though, that. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I, it's, it's, I didn't even mean for that to happen. And I've read that Stephen King didn't either. So um, I, I just There's think a connection that, there. I'm telling you, it's, yeah. uh, it's, <laughs> uh, I do like the Holly Gibney character and uh, I, I, I really haven't read like, the new one, but I do like all the other, what, four or five she's in. I've read everything except yeah. the newest one. And King's done that really well to his credit. I mean, he handles that character well. I get a little nervous about just keep returning to the same character because I don't want him to turn into some sort of almost like comic book character or something. Yeah. Like how like many are always the, defeating the ghost. Yeah. Like, like, how the many new adventures people? of yada yada. What what are they gonna get into this week? What exactly. adventure are they gonna, you know, have to get out of? Same bat I mean, time, same bat channel. <laughs> I try to, I mean, I'm writing about you know, stuff that most people absolutely do not believe in the supernatural. So there's already, you're already having to suspend your disbelief a little bit, mm-hmm. but also try to keep it grounded a little bit. Yeah. Um, and like you said, on the subtle side, and I just think if, if this woman keeps encountering all these creatures, I mean, at, at some point it's <laughs> that suspension of disbelief gets harder and harder and harder to do. I think it's interesting that she wasn't in this at all originally. So was there another character that was like sort of her in her place and you kind of swapped? Yes. Her? Okay. Yeah. Um, Cause she has you know, a pretty significant role in this. Yes. And it was another character. And in the first draft, the, uh, you know, the role that she plays, um, it's another character entirely. And then as I rewrote it, I, that character became more and more a part of the story. Like in the first draft, a lot of that stuff that's happening at the end that the the protagonist, she's tagging along with the protagonist helping out, you know, and that's not going on at the end. He was kind of on his own in the original. Okay. So, um, but I thought, you know, she's, she's lived here a long time. Uh, she used to be a constable and she, she knows all these back roads. So this would be kind of natural. He's trying to find this missing kid at the end of this book and what better person to help him out with that than someone that knows the lay of the land like she does. Mm-hmm. And with, with you being a teacher, are you, did you, do you teach seventh grade as well? Or do you teach a different grade? Man, I, uh, I'm certified seven through 12 and, okay. uh, yes, I've taught seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 and 12. Okay. Um, and this year I do have a little class of seventh graders and last year I did too. So yeah. Are we going to find the sentencing on their reading material uh, list? No. <laughs> I, I know we discussed that before, like trying to slide your 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 work into uh, the syllabus for the year, but no, I'm, it's I'm, something I'm, new and it's it's not too <laughs> hardcore and, and gory or anything, so you can probably get away with it. Come I on. don't really even advertise the fact that I'm a writer to the kids. Like I tell them, I love writing and I'm always mm-hmm. writing something, but I don't tell them, oh, I've got books on Amazon. Y'all should check them out. <laughs> I don't, cause you know, I mean, I, I think my stuff's pretty, uh, I tend to go for the, uh, I want it to be gritty and creepy. Um, I'm not offended by foul language. I'm not offended by excess violence. I've, I've read plenty of that stuff. Um, it just doesn't come naturally to me to write like that. Right. I like the more subtle, I go for the creepy and the subtle over that. So my books, there, there's a, there's some foul language here or there. And, uh, I try to keep it realistic though. And yeah. uh, so I'm not totally comfortable putting that stuff in my classroom <laughs> or anything like that. But with your, with your experience as a teacher, did that help you write the character of, was it, is it Dr. James? Is that his name? Yeah. Ed James. Or Ed James. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. He's like I said, a lot of that stuff that goes on in the classroom, uh, mm-hmm the assignments he's giving the notebooks that they write in the, the free rights. I've, I've done all that stuff. Uh, it's, okay. If it's in a classroom, it's probably, um, it's probably something I've 
experienced and done, or at the very least, it's made it into the lesson plan book. So, <laughs> and the, you know, one of the reasons I teach is because I love the kids and uh, I've, I don't know what it's like, thank God, to have a student go missing or anything. But I like to think if I did, I'd be out beating the bushes like these people in this story were. Along yeah. with, I was, I was going to bring that up because I'm, I'm, I mean, was there ever any uh, any thought in your head while you were writing this? Maybe you shouldn't put something like that in it just so you don't want to jinx it, obviously. You don't want that to happen in the future. or You know what I mean? I, I'd be a little worried about, okay, if I write this, there's a chance it could come true. And then, <laughs> you, yourself up you know, just... <laughs> I'm superstitious like that too. So yeah, that, that stuff comes to <laughs> me, but then I'm like, you know, if you want to write a good story, sometimes you have to make yourself uncomfortable and, Mm -hmm. Um, I like to think that at the end of the day, if I, you know, if I write about a kid that goes missing, it's not actually going to happen. And then I tell myself, come on, if it does, it's not like you did it. So <laughs> <laughs> you put that kernel out in the universe and you made it happen, Mitch. Yeah. Oh, I don't think I'm cursing the universe or anything, but yeah, I'm superstitious. I think about stuff like that sometimes like, man, you write about all this horrible stuff. Like, are you just inviting this into your own life somehow? Yeah. Um, He've, I've written about people that are, you know, in folklore and other the Riley Saunders novels. There's a guy with, he's got the knot on his neck and he's con he's convinced he's, you know, very, very, very ill with cancer or something. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I sit back and at bed at night and think, am I bringing this on myself or something? If I got this, waking up in cold sweats. <sighs> no. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But then I've, I keep reading. I was reading an article and, and somebody said, you know, if you if you want your stuff to uh, to hit people, if you want them to remember it and if you want it to be <laughs> if you want it to be honest, sometimes you you have to make yourself uncomfortable. Um, and so I don't I try not to shy away from anything. If it's natural to the story, then I'll go there. Yeah. I'm not going to throw anything in just to try to shock somebody or anything. Cause I think in the world we live in, you're not going to shock anybody with anything. Um, but if it's, if it's natural to the story, no matter what it is, then I'll probably go there. I mean, I'm sure I've got a line somewhere, but it's, it's not been reached yet. Ross's comment made me laugh. Kid goes missing. All eyes turn to their teacher who wrote about a missing kid. <laughs> yeah, it's it's true. It could he get was, a he was a quiet teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's why he didn't put the books in his classroom, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> why. Yeah. So what's the uh, the response been like for those that you uh, sent this out to before it came out? It's been very positive. I mean, sure. you know, I haven't sold 10,000 copies of it or anything, but I well, you, you will after the, sh the show. Yeah. That's you the, after the show. Yeah. That's, the, that's the plan. I uh, hey, don't, don't write a check. We can't cash today. <laughs> I, I sent out some early copies of it, just trying to, you know, see what people thought of it and maybe get a few reviews lined up. Cause when I first started doing this, like it's hard for me to believe, but I think I've been publishing on KDP since like 2013 or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, my stuff would just sit there and it wouldn't get a review and it wouldn't sell because I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I think I was, a, I think I know my way around the English language. All right. And I reminds me, I could put mine on Amazon <laughs> after the show. Um, yeah. But I was just trying <laughs> to make sure this thing didn't hit with no reviews or anything like that. And it, yeah. it's been positive. Um, I haven't had anybody. They haven't all left a review yet, but I've, I've gotten some emails and some comments. And so yeah, the, Brad, I've. Jay, <laughs> I was I finished, all, I, was, book. I finished the book. I was all set to be the first review, and then I realized Brian Bowyer beat me to it. I was like, Damn Brian, it. man, Brian read it, it probably like thirty minutes walking around his living room, and he was Brian, dying. Brian was Brian was amazing. I'm not kidding. I sent him the book. I don't remember exactly how this went down, but it was close to it. I sent him the book, and then I went for a run that afternoon. And while I'm running, he was like, hey, you got a typo on this page. I'm really enjoying it. And I'm thinking I, I, I pause my run and I, I reply to him. Thanks. By the time I finish my run, I'm sitting there on the tailgate cooling down. And he's like already done with it. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, machine. he's he is. He's a great guy, too. I mean, he mm -hmm. he was enthusiastic about reading it and he helped me spot a couple of errors in it and um, had his review up and 
Yeah. I mean, I know everybody's life is different, but I really appreciate, you know, uh, the, he was just on it and I really appreciate that. Yeah. I've seen so shout out, shout it. out to Brian and, and everybody that's read it. And for that matter, I mean, I know what it's like. I'll tell people I'll read something and it might take me a week to get to it. So I, mm -hmm. I mean, shout out to everybody that is willing to read what I write and review it. But, yeah. That's what I was telling Brad. I, 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 I read like the first good chunk of it. The first couple of days I had it, and then there's like a week, week and a half in between writing. I couldn't get to it, yeah. You know, and then I was able to finish the rest of it and put something together, yeah. So it, it is a quick read. It's what about 100 pages or so? Yeah, it's about 100 yeah. pages. Yeah. Um, it was. It's the shortest thing I've published, like as a standalone. And uh, but I was I was at peace with that because I'm like, well, that means I'm not going to have to charge very much for it. Um, and. I think that that's kind of the direction a lot of people are going with their reading. I've noticed like um, eBooks and stuff have brought the novella back from the dead as an art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I really appreciate that because it's like, it's long enough to sink your teeth into a little bit and get attached to the characters, but it doesn't overstay its welcome either. I hope so. Yeah. I, I, I love the novella because I have a very short attention span. <laughs> <laughs> like you always say, Jay, it's like, it's like a, hour and a half horror movies it's like a, a lot of horror movies are hour and a half and that's that's about a, a novella so yeah you know 90 minutes 90 pages yeah do you with something shorter like this did you feel did you feel limited at all like i wanted to add more backstory about a character or anything like that and you were trying to fit it in this novella form or you, know, you said you're pretty happy with how it came out you know i think um the trick to getting a novella right is because some I have read novellas before where I'm thinking, uh, well, I wish they had made it in the novel because there's, I wanted more about this. And right. This. Right. And then I read some novellas and I'm thinking you had a short story here and you just needed to make it a little longer. Um, but when they're, when they're done, when you hit that sweet spot, I think they're perfect. And I worry about that when I write something this length, because I think yeah. did I just miss it and this, I need to be patient with this and, and add more is more going to come to me later, but I feel good about this one. Cause I really did sit on it for like a year yeah. thinking about it. And I went back to it and totally rewrote so much of it. So I feel good about this one. I don't, I don't think there's anything that I don't think there's anything put in there for the sake of fluff. Right. And I don't think there's anything in there that needs to be uh, expounded upon a lot yeah. more either. I, I've read novellas before where I'm like, okay, you know, you could probably extend this and, and get that novel area but i've also read novels where i'm like okay you you read a novel. you're like cut 100 pages yeah. of this i know place. it's like every, every time i read a novel i'm like you know what this was 50 pages too long i mean it's like <laughs> this could have been cut out this could have been cut out you know no there are some good novels i've read that are good links you know but still yeah there are some that are like okay page 400 we're not even to the you know the main part yet <laughs> what are you talking about i mean i love a good I love a good thick book. I still love getting lost in them. Um, but yeah, I have read novels before where I'm thinking this could have been literally cut in half. Yeah, I, I feel like, and I'm not out to, I mean, at least half of what I read is traditionally published stuff from authors that I've enjoyed for years. So I'm not like knocking traditional publishing at all, but start naming uh, names, Mitch. <laughs> uh, I really don't have any specific names, but I'm just joking. Don't don't yeah. start naming names. I think um, I think that you know traditionally published novels. If you notice, they're all pretty much the same width on the shelf. It's like they've all got to be this like, certain length. And I feel um, like the last couple of Stephen King books, they're all like 430 pages exactly. Yeah, or like the last five or six. Yeah, and I don't know if that's just um, as he's gotten maybe that's just kind of the groove he settled into or if it's mm -hmm. I, I don't know but it's like that's probably his sweet spot because he's used to doing eight or nine hundred page books so the yeah. 400 page book is his novella version i just <laughs> yeah. think it's where they're all the exact it's not like 435 and 428 they're all like 430 it just i just think that's i weird. i appreciate the fact that with the uh self-published and indie publishing scene you can kind of <laughs> do what needs to be done if it needs to be 97 pages, it can be. You don't have to hit that magic 70 yeah. to 90,000. This thing's got to be about an inch and a half thick so it looks right in Walmart or something. And we yeah. can charge $30 for it. Right. Right. Yeah. 
it's when you um real quick like the original one to where you rewrote it are they about the same length or was one longer than the other one uh the this one is about a thousand words longer than okay. the other one and i don't know how much of that is me adding to it and how much of it is me just running it through the mill with editing it because i uh i write it and then i set it aside for a few days and then i pull it back out and i just attack it with a red pen and then i go through it again and then i mean i put it through three or four rounds and mm -hmm. it always comes out a little bit shorter mm -hmm. um and this thing when it was all said and done was about a thousand words longer than the original after it had been edited a little bit and there were a couple of specific scenes i added so a little bit longer but um not really that's, that's not too bad that's pretty pretty close for rewriting the whole thing yeah, I'm actually putting my review on Amazon while I'm think while I'm thinking of it. Just <laughs> You're copying. That's what Ross was doing a second ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it's it's the same as what I put on Goodreads, but you know, <laughs> you, you got a couple of ratings already. Brian Bow, you beat me to this one too. Jeez. <laughs> Ross wants to know: Are you are you writing longhand still, or do you type it out? Um. Okay, this one was this one went against my longhand thing. And you know, I love writing longhand. That's like my preferred way to write a first draft. But it's funny. I wrote in 2023, I probably wrote 150,000 words this year, and I published 20 something thousand of them with this little book right here. And um a hundred thousand of that was two novels that I started in a notebook. Like I wrote one at the beginning of the year is about, I got about 50,000 words into it. It's still sitting there unfinished. And then for Nano Remo, just this last November, I wrote another 50,000 words longhand. And both of those are still sitting there and unfinished. And then this little thing right here, I, I went straight to typing it because I knew I was going to have to write quickly. You know, when I did that original version of it and uh so yeah go figure the one that i didn't uh write <laughs> and my preferred method is the one that i ended up feeling best about and i got sick of letting it sit there because i really did feel good about the story and that's mm -hmm. the one i published but yeah okay so to answer his question i got carried away there uh no, i good. still do i still do write longhand i love writing longhand that is I feel like I've just got more freedom when I'm writing longhand. Like I'm not, for some reason, when I'm typing, I feel like this is closer to a final draft. Uh -huh. And when I'm, when I'm writing longhand, I just feel like I can put anything I want. It's very liberating. When you write longhand, do you go back and like you scratch stuff out or you write in pencil or pen or I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I do most of it with a, I usually write with a mechanical pencil. Okay. And if it's a minor thing, I'll erase it. But sometimes I'll go back and realize I don't want those three lines and I'm not going to use my eraser on all that. So I'll just mark yeah. it out. Because they're usually small erasers on those mechanical yeah. ones. <laughs> Only so much you can do with those. Yeah. <laughs> like dump what the big, the, yeah, get the, the big pink eraser. You had, yeah. yeah. <laughs> some there's students no, probably have. There's no highlight and delete with, you know, long <laughs> hand. So it's just marking it out. Do you feel like writing it longhand instead of just you know, typing? Do you feel like you're more, I don't know what word I want to use, more in in the story, if that makes sense? Like you're, you're physically having to write out instead of, you know, you can type however many words a minute. It's more, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. I, I, I think I know what you're, I do feel more like invested in the story, if that makes sense. Because you're, it slows you down so much. It's like more like, intimate almost, if that makes yeah. sense, to write it out longhand. It's, you feel closer to it. And uh, I love how it slows me down because usually um, I'm not in a hurry. Even when I do the, you know, nano Remo or nano Rimo or whatever they call it. Um, even when I'm doing that, I feel like, well, if I get my 50,000 words, that's the goal. That doesn't mean the story has to be done. So right. I don't care if it takes me three months to write this thing. So I'm not in a hurry and I love being slowed down. It makes me think more. I think I get more invested in the story. Um, and at the same time, it just makes it more liberating. Uh, I like that you say you're not in, a, you're not in a hurry because I, not to say, not to point anybody particular out or say people rush to get their work out, but sometimes you could tell when someone's kind of rushed to get something out because uh, it's got, uh, plot holes and it's got errors mm -hmm. and stuff. And it's like, 
you know, if you would have took your time where, I mean, you have plenty of other work out. You could advertise while you're working on something new. You yeah. Know, the fact, you could take your time and do all that stuff. Yeah. So. And that's another thing. When you handwrite, it's almost like you're getting another free shot at the draft because yeah. you have to go back and type all that stuff up. Right. And the, uh, the, the process of taking it from handwritten to typed up on the computer, um, that's another chance to work with the story. And, you know, if you go straight to typing it, I mean, you can still put it through as many drafts as you want, but something about handwriting it and then typing it up, you're changing it as you type it up. Yeah. And, so, and Ross mentions, mentioned that he does this on a typewriter, which I know he has. Cause I, I've seen pictures where he's got it laid out. Yeah. He did his, his new one on the typewriter. I love that too. Yeah. I, I love that. I've got a couple of old typewriters in my uh, book room, as I call it here. And I don't have the uh, courage Mm. try to write a whole novel on a typewriter it it almost scares me but i i respect it i that's almost like handwriting because i know that's got to be kind of slow and tedious yeah i feel like that's gonna be yeah. slower than handwriting because you're like i, I do I yeah mess this up. <laughs> you got you got you know old typewriters you gotta hit those buttons hard and you're like oh yeah. the ribbon messed up and where am i going to find a new ribbon what store sells a ribbon <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know yeah and, and i'm like if go ahead sorry no i was saying i've I'm almost afraid I might like physically hurt myself trying to top a novel on a typewriter too. <laughs> you have a Ross, strong Ross fingers at the end. <laughs> Ross said he'll never do it again. Not for a novel anyway. Maybe short yeah. stories, but not a novel. <laughs> I really respect that because that is a level of dedication and, uh, and seeing that through to the end like that. And I bet that story, you know, to your handwriting point, um, I bet that story wouldn't have been the same had he gone straight to Microsoft Word or Google Docs or something to do that. You know, the, not just going to word vomit on the typewriter. I it's mean, his time and pick. When you're being slowed down like that, like with a typewriter, even with a pencil and paper, um, just by going slower, it's giving your brain more chances to come up with stuff. Yeah. So you go straight to the computer keyboard. It probably wouldn't have been the same story. I would be opposite. It's giving me more time to forget what I wanted to write. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it could be like that too <laughs> yeah yeah what's that what was it say do you ever worry like where you're taking your time writing it freehand like that that you're maybe going too slow and you're gonna maybe like lose the thread of the story or anything or you're not really worried about anything like that well unfortunately um if i'm writing every day i don't worry about that mm -hmm. but if i like the, the one i was working on in november um I mean, I eventually I'm going to get back to it. And when I do, I dread it because I'm going to have to go back and try to read like a um, hundred and whatever pages of my chicken scratch and try to figure <laughs> out what in the world's going on here. Cause I barely remember what I wrote, but um, as long as I'm writing every day, I don't worry about that. But if I step away from it at all, it's, it's a lot easier to revisit something on a computer than it is in a notebook, but. Can your wife read your handwriting? Yes, if it's... Uh, <clears throat> There's a hesitation here. I know. <laughs> what, the handwriting that I use when I'm writing my books, probably not. Because it's so much of it is just squiggly lines and stuff is marked out. And, right, right. You know, there's, but um, if I slow down just a little bit, then yeah, she can read it. So you have different kinds of handwriting... Well, it's if I know that someone's going to have to read this. Right. Other I mean, because I, I have different kinds of handwriting. Like I notice, like. Mine's terrible. I'm if, terrible. If I'm having like a good hand day, I write better. But if I'm having like a, <laughs> you know, like an arthritis hand day, it's like I can't even read what I wrote, you know, yeah. and my wife can't read what I write by hand. So I was just curious if like your spouse could t you read what you, you know, what you write. <laughs> so, I don't know. Some of my brain was. So. I'm capable of writing. Okay. But yeah. <laughs> my default handwriting, when I'm just in the middle of a book or something, it's, I mean, anybody that tries to read that good luck. Cause like I said, yeah. a lot of times if I step away from it for too long, I can't figure out what I was saying. You, you ought to want one of these times after you release the book um, in the back of the book, have the original handwritten It'll be almost be like First a lyric or something. It'd be like, you know, how it came together. That'd be I do. I do keep those. I've got a shelf of um, notebooks that have my first drafts in them. It's pretty interesting to go back to them after a few years and see, you know, all the changes that 
ended up being made before the thing got published. I mean, I think that's cool. Like I, I do it with bands, like, you know, back in the eighties and nineties, you would open up the cassette or the album and you would see like handwritten lyrics and stuff. And mm -hmm. I mean, looking back, that's pretty cool. I, I never saw like uh like an actual book, you know, I, uh, like that. Pearl jams that I know you're a Pearl jam fan and I right. love, the, I love their lyric booklets where I, I honestly think that's like Eddie Vedder's topped up. Cause yeah. I've heard he writes their lyrics on a typewriter. Yeah. And it, it, yeah, it does both. Yeah. I love, I love seeing like an original work product like that. Yeah. It's yeah. fascinating. You never have to worry about it. if you lose your notebook in a taxi, no one's going to steal it and sell your books. It will be able no. to read your writing. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is cool. We're talking about this because the actual cover for the sentence scene has got handwriting. Yeah. It's got chicken scratch on there too. All right. So yeah, that was, that was all me. And I, I went in and intentionally messed some of it up. I didn't want it to be like perfectly readable in the background there, but um, actually something from the book on the cover. Yeah. It started out as a, uh, there's a, in the book, there's a journal entry that the, the kid that went missing, she had written on one of her school assignments. And I right. just kind of, I wrote that out myself thinking, well, I might use it for the cover or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And I did. But I also went back and kind of messed it up. I didn't want people to just be able to pick the book up and read this perfectly. You know, <laughs> I didn't want that. On the cover. Yeah. So I messed it up a little bit and um, I didn't know what I was going to do with the cover. And I know I know people say writers shouldn't do their own covers, especially when they're not a professional. But sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. I like that cover. I mean, it's it's simple, but it ties into the whole story I, to me i was about to say i kind of wanted this little book it's the shortest thing i've ever done on my own and i just wanted it to be uh all me you know yeah. for some reason i was very attached to the story and i sat on it for a year and um i really like the story i think it's very honest and i wanted to uh i wanted to do my own cover for some reason and i, I went through four or five different ideas and came up with that and i thought well um I think I could do something with that. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, but yeah, the cover's all me. So rather you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's all me, but I have used the other, um, I have you like, uh, the Dustin time cover was professionally done. Right. And yeah, uh, I like that one a lot. That's cool. The things we cannot say was professionally done. And, mm -hmm. um, but then some of them I do myself like this one and my last one, the Wayfarer house. I did both of those myself. I like that cover. That's a good cover too. Yeah. See, I, I like this kind of artwork though for this cover. I mean, it's just what I've always leaned towards. So I, that's pretty yeah. cool with the, the I just kind of had it in my head. Stuff. Here's this, you know, this kid is the one really, I mean, the dad's the one I don't want to give too much away either, but in, in the story, you know, there's this kid, that goes missing and her dad is the one that's being haunted by this ghost from the past. Right. But she's the real victim in all this, not the guy that's being haunted. I mean, yeah. he kind of, he kind of had it coming. Right. So um, it's the, it's the poor kid that's the victim. And so I'm thinking, well, this is something a kid would do. She would, she would write this in this notebook. And if she's been seeing this thing too, that, that depiction on the cover is maybe just kind of a hand scrawled depiction yeah. of what she's, what she's seen in her house. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the whole thing looks like a snapshot from her writing notebook that she would have turned in. Yeah. And that, that's what I was going for. So yeah, that's cool. I like that. It worked. I, I really, when I first uploaded it and I saw the, just the little, you know, thumbnail on Amazon, I was kind of worried, mm -hmm. but I got my paperback copy in the mail and I'm very, very happy with how it looks. Oh, that's cool. I was going to ask how that looked. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a physical I've, copy of it. I don't know. It's, it's right here, but I was here we go. Okay. Very, cool. very pleased with how it turned out on the paperback. Well, yeah, um, there's everybody can see. Yeah. It looks good on paperback. I like the where it's going into the spine looks good too. Like it's yeah. on the side. I was, I was happy with that. I was relieved because I thought, I don't know some about Amazon kind of, it almost looks too light. Like it's not, it doesn't have the dynamics that I put on the original, but it showed up really yeah. well on the paperback. Yeah, sometimes the pictures on Amazon they're not good quality of yeah. what the actual cover is. Yeah, I, I've noticed that sometimes your color is off when you get it. And you're like, 
I was expecting so something s- brighter or something. So yeah, I'll go get the pictures of them from Amazon for like the thumbnails and stuff. And some of them like these look terrible. Like I'll go get it. Yeah, pictures. exactly. Yeah. But since this is a it's a ghost story, and you've written about ghosts in other books. Do you yourself believe in the supernatural or anything, or or is that just something you just like to write about? He's thinking you just opened up a whole can of worms here. Whole can of worms. <laughs> I yes. want I want to believe. Like, okay. and sometimes sometimes I think I do. Like I've I've been in places that are supposedly haunted and, you know, you get creeped out in there, you hear things and um, and, you know, my my family, we've over the years had some experiences like you, you lose a loved one or something and you're just convinced of something. And and I think there may be something to that. Like I tell my wife, like I, I really think sometimes there may be something to that because. I mean, I don't even pretend to have all the answers or know what all's out there. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as the type of ghosts that I write about, like vengeful spirits and, you know, um, stuff like that, um, demonic possession. Uh, I guess the answer is still I don't know, but I'll say I don't think anything I've written about could actually happen. I mean, yeah. but hey, the thought that something might be out there that we don't know about or that we can't explain or the thought that there's something after death. I mean, I'm, I'm very open to that. It's kind of like the question about, do you believe in God? And I'm thinking, well, to me, the most honest answer is, you know, don't claim to have all the answers. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, there's there's just be open to the fact that we're human beings and we can't possibly understand um, everything about the universe and what happens after death and all that. So, yeah, I think there could be something like ghost out there, maybe. I don't, I personally don't believe, but I would be open to it. I've just never experienced anything myself to make me like, oh yeah, that's a ghost. So if yeah. I were to experience something, I'd be open to it. But, but there's know, something I'm, behind you right now, Brad. Something behind me. I'm always fascinated by like the ghost hunter shows and stuff, but I'll watch those all the time. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, hey, I've never, um, I've never experienced anything. Um, I like that comment, by the way. About the Nirvana artwork. Yeah. It reminds yeah. me of Nirvana artwork. It um, does, yeah. I've never experienced anything remotely like anything I've written about. So I can't. <laughs> that's why I, I think if if the classic ghost trope were really a thing, I think we would have heard about it by now as a species. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um but uh yeah, I've, I'm also like I said, open minded about the fact that I don't have all the answers, so Maybe, and I guess that's why I'm still writing about it. Maybe I'm looking to figure some of this stuff out. I think if you would experience anything like you write, you would definitely believe in ghosts. <laughs> there wouldn't be a maybe to it. That's the truth. There's a scene in this book where um, I've never actually managed to scare myself writing anything. But there is a scene in this book that made me a little bit uneasy as I was writing it. Um, when the ghost actually reveals itself. Cause I started thinking, man, if I walked into a room and <laughs> you know, um, that was in front of me mm-hmm. and it's somebody that I was close to like that, a loved one. Um, it, it kind of made me a little uneasy. The uh, closest thing I've ever done to scaring myself when I was writing something. Uh, I don't want to say what it is cause I don't want to give anything away, but yeah, like what, um, Ed thieves and then what his thoughts are after that would be extremely creepy if that were a loved one that you were maybe seeing. Yeah. What he thinks maybe has has happened. And that's another thing that got added in. I knew in the first draft um, that I hadn't fleshed that scene out enough. Like that scene was in the first one, but it just kind of, it's almost like when you're writing a song and you just didn't kind of hold that, you didn't hold that note long enough or you needed to play that riff through one more time before you move on to the next section. I thought that scene's just too, it's there and then it's over. I need mm-hmm. to flesh that out a little bit. And I did that and wound up creeping myself out a little bit. So like, it's still a quick scene, but like the, the thought process after that of what he's thinking about is what makes exactly. it really creepy. Yeah, exactly. So where do you uh, rank this one with <laughs> all of the rest? I think rank his books. Well, no, no, I mean, so, I mean, ha- could you tell that your writings has changed any over the years or did you have more fun writing this one as opposed to any of the other ones? Was this one easier than writing some of the other ones? 
would you this prefer one, someone start out with this one if they're just now getting into your work? You know what I mean? So if you're just now reading something that I've written, I think that this thing is very representative of what I do. And it's a very quick read and it's going to set you back less than a cup of coffee. So this is a this is a good place to start. Um, and I had a lot of fun writing it like yeah. um, it. Uh, I mean, right now, I feel like it's at the top of the list. Um, cause I feel good about the story and I really enjoyed writing it, but there's nothing that I've written that I go back and think, man, I wish I hadn't written that, or I wish I hadn't right. done that, but, um, I'm real, I really am partial to this one. This one and the last one I wrote the Wayfarer house. Mm-hmm. I love the vibe that I think I captured in both of those. The, the, those two feel like they, they kind of came easier. Like it was a smoother process for you, not as forced or. I'm pretty good about not forcing my way through anything. I'm all about the wisdom of, um, you know, just get the draft finished. It's natural to struggle with a rough draft. So just get it finished. Um, But I'm also, if, if something is just not working, I'm not going to force the issue. Right. So nothing I've written has ever felt like forced like that. But I will say um, this one and the Wayfarer house, I guess it was just, the subject matter and all that it uh they were both a lot of fun to write and i think they're both a good mix of intense when they need to be but also kind of subtle and creepy in all the right places and i think either one of those is a good place to start if you're wanting to read the stuff that i've written i've asked the last couple guests this so i'm gonna ask you as well i really was grabbed by your opening like the first you know sentence or so Mm-hmm. really grabbed my attention. So was that something you like purposely constructed to like try to grab the reader's attention? Like how long did you spend time on trying to work on the intro with the beginning of the book to like grab the reader? I, uh, I think you, you read the, did you read the beginning the other day? Like in a video, I think you mm-hmm. read it as well. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, I don't really, sometimes I remember exactly why I start a book out the way I do. Mm-hmm. And uh, but this one again, this whole thing just kind of came naturally. I just honestly, when I sat down to write this story, I had my main character and I had kind of a general premise in my mind. Mm-hmm. And then I just uh sat down and wrote that first sentence about you know, uh, the my boy being shot however many times with a pocket 32, and yeah. it just the story started unfolding from there. So that wasn't like an intentional attention grabber. Mm -hmm. But when I went back and read it, when I was proofreading it and editing it, you know, I realized, well, that's a good way. I mean, sometimes I'll go back and change the beginning of a book 10 times trying to figure out where to start it and how I'm going to get the reader's attention. But this one, it just kind of fell into place from the start. So I read the first sentence like, I need to know more. I need to know what's going on. Yeah. Definitely grab my attention with it right from the very beginning. Yeah. No, and that's, I mean, I was hoping that was the effect. I, I enjoyed when you, uh, I don't remember if you messaged me that or if you tweeted that, or I think it may, you may have replied to something I put on X or Twitter oh, yeah. or whatever it's called. I was glad to hear that because um, I remember yeah. when I was proofing this thing thinking, well, that's a good <laughs> opening. That's like one of the more natural openings I've ever written. It's good. It is. Well, yeah, I you appreciate said, that. Yeah the kid gets shot. You're like, Oh, I definitely need to know more about what's going on. Yeah. And I, I wanted to ask about the, like where um, Ed James, where he lives, he's like on the Canyon. He's looking down like this abandoned, like, is it like a city or neighborhood or what is the abandoned place he's looking at? Like down in the Canyon. Oh yeah. He, uh, his property um, backs up to the edge of a Canyon which there really is a place in Arkansas. We call it like the Grand Canyon of the Ozarks or something like that. <laughs> um, it's, it, it is a beauty. I mean, it's nothing like the Grand Canyon, obviously, but it's, uh, it, it's more or less based on that. It's just a deep Valley where the bodies are hidden. Yes. <laughs> it's, uh, but his, his property in the story backs up to this, uh, really deep, pretty, just lush green Valley. And there's a ghost town down there there, where there used to be a mine and um which again there were a lot of those up in the mountains here in arkansas Mm -hmm. so a lot of this is based on you know actual geography up there but um 
his property backs up to that. And that's where he goes to. He's had a lot of thinking to do over the years after losing his son and relocating and changing professions. But that's where he goes to kind of calm down and do his thinking. He just looks out over this uh, canyon down into that ghost town. All right. And of Anything course, that, that, that ends up being relevant later in the story. Anything with a ghost town or abandoned place or anything that I don't know why that just really gets my attention. I watch those videos on YouTube all the time where people are going into abandoned houses and all that stuff. That's just it's really a it's a thing that keeps popping up in my stuff too. I I really try to make an effort to not rewrite the same story over and over again just for the sake of putting content out there. But mm -hmm. I'm beginning to notice that if you read something I've written, there's probably going to be a ghost, mm -hmm. and there's probably going to be a mountain somewhere. <laughs> someone's going to be hiking on a trail at some point and there's at least a 50% chance there's going to be a mine or a ghost town in it or both. <laughs> so <laughs> um, there's just something so fascinating about like a town and just everyone leaves and it's just sits, sits there. I, th I saw a video the other day, Jay, I was like a neighborhood in Ohio. It's just there are so, yeah, and, yeah, there I, I've, I've started coming across a, uh, TikTok they're videos. Like, they're like really nice houses. Just yeah. Completely, they're just all like, totally abandoned. Yeah. No, no, I, I, there are a couple of places in Ohio that um, I saw on TikTok where they nice houses. Yeah. Yeah. Nice houses was, and just like totally abandoned neighborhoods and stuff. It's like, it was like a big neighborhood. It was like 50, 100 houses. And yeah. Just, yeah. It's gone. Everyone just it's left fascinating. I, I like to go out to Colorado and hike in the Rockies, you know, and, and climb some of those mountains. And they've got all sorts of ghost towns out there. Yeah, and and I love seeing these places and e even stuff like Chernobyl and all that. Just places oh, yeah. where they they used to be just full of life, and now it's just, you know, forgotten and and left for the elements. And it's it's fascinating thinking about what used to be there, yeah. and you know, and if you're like me or some of the other writers that I read, you're thinking, what might still be going on there now <laughs> that we don't know about. For those uh, Ohio uh, neighborhoods, I think some of that had to do with uh, the shady loans for some of those uh, housing developments. Oh, like, yeah, because the, there was some housing developments uh, ages ago that went up quick, and it was like no interest for two years. And then when those balloon so interests the balloon kicked interest in, rate, people yeah. just abandoned the houses. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not to go too far off track, but I was watching um, a show called Expedition Unknown the other day, and it was a specific episode about world war ii and the japanese front and it was just like the small little island chain and the island wasn't very big it was maybe the size of a couple of football fields but the japanese had like terraformed it and like built a runway they knocked everything down it was just all concrete buildings and they were going back to investigate stuff like missing airplanes and stuff and it's now completely overgrown they're showing pictures like back 80 years ago there was no trees and now you would never know that there was a runway on it and all that stuff it's just i don't yeah. know stuff like that's kind of cool yeah. No, it's I, I I go down some rabbit trails, you know, mm -hmm. getting online and just reading about all this stuff. And uh, you can get some book ideas from some of it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anything said in a abandoned place, I'm going to read it. I just, yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> what's what next? What what's what's next on your agenda? What what are you working on now? Um, I haven't. Those two fifty thousand word books. He's. I mean, yeah, I've got a hundred thousand dollar or hundred thousand. I wish I had a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> sitting in this room, yeah, just right over here. I've got a hundred thousand words sitting here. I need to do something with, and um, I want to take. I, I want to write something. It, it occurred to me, um, I would love to try my hand at writing something that doesn't take place in this world, like okay. see if I could create my own world. I don't know if I have it in me or not to do that. Mm -hmm. I always end up coming. It, it's almost um, unnatural to me because I just feel like I like to write this gritty stuff that takes place in this now, reality. Now you're kind of teetering on fantasy stuff. Yeah, and if I did that, it would be a more of a dark fantasy. Okay, uh, but I don't know. I've I've kind of been. I'm gonna have to eventually try it just to get it out of my system. Right, right. But um, as far as what might see the light of day next, I'm probably gonna finally do something with one of these unfinished manuscripts because the sad thing is they were all i mean they're probably all 10 to twenty thousand words away from being done they're going to be full-length novels but it's not like i still had another fifty thousand words to go or something and they have mountains and ghosts it, yes 
Okay. Just, just a few know. more mountains, sure. a few more ghosts, and they'll be yeah. down. <laughs> a few extra mountains, a few extra ghosts. Yeah. Just to extend itself. Yeah. I do want to ask about the end of the sentencing. I don't want to say anything at all, but it was sort of like the very, very end was a bit ambiguous. Yeah. And there was somewhere I wanted you to go that in my mind, I thought that's where it went. So did you purposely leave it or just cut it there? Mm -hmm. The reader can maybe fill in what they thought might happen next. Yeah. I like to, I don't like to be just left totally hanging, but also don't. And it didn't do that. You didn't totally leave us hanging. There's like, one more step's like, oh, this will happen next. It's like, that's yeah. what I think is going to happen. Well, it, it ties it up, but it's just, I, I know what you're Yeah, about. and that's kind of like what one I, more, There's like one more breadcrumb you could have mentioned, but you didn't. So, that's so like, what okay. I prefer as a reader. So I guess that's where I go as a writer. Like, I don't like it when the author just, it, it's almost like there's too much of an epilogue here. I don't need mm-hmm. to know every little thing, but yeah. I also don't want to leave the reader hanging. I, I hate that too, where you're, so I try to hit that sweet spot where, I've led you far enough and maybe you can take it the the rest of the way with however your mind kind of pictures uh-huh. it going. Right. I felt like with what you said near the end, you were kind of hinting at maybe what I thought might happen. I don't know. I'll, yeah. well, I'll tell you after the show what I think. And, and if it's, if you're not. talking about the issue that I think you're talking about, um, in my mind, I think that's what happened. So, okay. And yeah. for those and for those listening and watching, you can find Everyone that out. If you beca- find out. you can yeah. find out if you become a Patreon and um, <laughs> send us fifty dollars each. I'm, I'm kidding. So you have to read the book, get to the end, figure out what we're talking about, and then come back and see what we're hinting at. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I, I want to say I'm on Twitter. I guess it's called X now. <laughs> yeah, X. Yeah. I don't know. I, I personally think that's lame, but whatever. Um, it's such like a generic name. Like, we we could so we could go ahead and and we could go ahead and start telling the end, and then just cut off the video real quick. Just to, <laughs> that'd be that'd be our, our cliffhanger, just to match the book. No, in my bit. luck, I wouldn't click it in time and we'd spoil it. Know, because you will click it, it would take like two or three seconds, and I'm still doing this. Because it asks you, "Are you sure?" So you have to yeah. click it twice. Yeah, reach out to me on X, and I'll. Uh, I'll answer any questions as best I can. Um, some of it people ask me like, um, did you mean to do this or is this what happened? And sometimes the answer is honestly, I don't know. Like mm-hmm. uh, I know it's my story with my characters, but, and it sounds kind of cheesy. I don't know, but sometimes these characters do take on lives of their own. Right. And I don't even know what they're going to be doing, you know, in the next scene or whatever, or where this is going. And when I leave it at the end of the book, um, I don't know what they're going to do after that either. I'm this glad one, you said that because I love when, when writers say that. Like Brian Bowyer says that a lot all the time too. He doesn't know what yeah, what yeah. path any of them are going to take. That, you know, he just that boggles it, so. my mind that like he, the writer, the creator, doesn't know what's going to happen next. Like that's my brain can't wrap around that. I truly, I, like uh, I would have to know every step, and we're like, no, whatever happens next is what happens next. It's just I don't think crazy to me. I don't think this metaphor is like unique to me. I'm pretty sure I read this somewhere else or heard somebody say it, but you're truly just like, to me, when I write, I'm like a guy with a flashlight in a dark hallway and I can see only so far ahead of me. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the story just keeps unfolding itself. Um, Cause I truly like, I, I just want to see where the story goes. That's why I, I'm not against outlining and I don't judge people that do. I'm sure some of my favorite books have been outlined to death, but just me personally, the way I work, um, I like taking the ride with the characters. Right. It, sometimes it works out about how I thought it would. And then sometimes I realize that I have reached a very dramatic turn that I didn't see coming at all. So hopefully the reader won't see it either. See, there are no mistakes, see, just happy see, accidents. I don't see how you do it. Like, how do you do that? Like you're writing and like, Oh, do you surprise yourself? Like, how does that happen? Like, can you even explain it? Um, to, to, to me, I can't, I just can't work that out in my head. Like how you don't know what's going to happen. It, it's I'll, I'll say like, sometimes even when you're just sitting down to write, like you will swear all day long, I'm stuck. It's not going to do me any good to sit down to write. Cause I don't know what to write. Mm-hmm. But then if you'll do like, I think it was Ernest Hemingway said, just sit down and just write a sentence, just write the truest sentence, you know, just if you can get your fingers on the keyboard and your fingers on the pencil or something and just start writing, you'll surprise yourself. 
And it's, it's kind of like that. Like you just start writing and before you know it, you have managed to break through your writer's block or whatever it was. And, uh, yeah, I can't exactly say how like an entire plot point can come without me seeing it. But sometimes you just write that sentence that you didn't see coming and you realize, well, now this story is going in a totally new direction. Yeah. Um, and it, it does happen sometimes. Like do you, the, ever, do you ever sit and like boast about that? Like, <laughs> yes, that, that came up. It did just like celebrate well, a little of, bit. <laughs> in, in this little story right here, and I'm like, I don't want to say too much. I like yeah. to think that even if it's just one or two people, someone's going to read this book and, you know, I don't want to say too much just from this video. And I hope it's more than that, but, um, I there's, a, we'll get to three, <laughs> the, the ghost town in this book. You know, when I, when I started writing the book, this is a, for instance, um, I'm just describing him sitting there at the back of his property. Mm -hmm. And when I started this book, I did not know that there would be a ghost town down there that just rolled off the fingertips as I'm typing. Oh, there's a, you know, remnants of a town down there. And then before you know it, 10,000 words later, they're down there, you know, looking for this kid. And then it ends up being a very important part of the plot. Right. And when I started the book, I had no idea. That was just something that randomly flew off my fingertips when I was writing that scene at the beginning. So that's kind of a example. Mindy thinks you explain it very well. It makes a lot of sense to her. Still I, for me, just like, I can't, I can't. can't that explanation is kind of like my writing. It just, I open Mindy, my get, mouth. Get the book, it read it. Just come out. Yeah. <laughs> Mindy, get, get the book, read it, and then come back and report to us. See if you got, see if you got it. <laughs> Stephen King says something like that. Like he's just writing down what the characters tell him to say, or yeah, that's paraphrase. Something like that he says. And I freely admit, like everything I learned about writing, I mean, when I was a little kid, it was, I think I told this to you guys in the first one we did, but mm -hmm. when I was really little, it was, you know, R.L. Stein's Goosebumps. Mm -hmm. And then I quickly graduated to like Clive Barker's The Thief of Always, which led me to Stephen King. And I just mm -hmm. became obsessed with Stephen King, like reading and collecting. And if he said something, that's the only way it can be because Stephen King said it, you know? <laughs> He said, I don't outline, so here's Mitch. He starts writing, and well, I'm not going <laughs> to outline either, and that's just how it unfolded. So, Even though that was during his blow years, and he doesn't, <laughs> doesn't remember saying it. <laughs> I guess it's pretty easy not to outline when you're... <laughs> yeah, like, I don't remember saying that now. Well, that, that was because I was during the whole Tommy Knockers time. <laughs> like, I, I know that he doesn't remember writing Cujo, but I heard the other day that he wrote the whole Cujo book over a weekend, like three days. Yeah, I don't know if that's true or not, but and the Running Man too. I think he, I think he wrote that in like a hotel room over a couple of days or something. That's crazy. And now the Tommy Knockers, I will say, um, I, I can see how that might have had some. Uh, Is that the one I'm thinking <laughs> of? That he, like he doesn't remember writing the whole middle. There's like 500 pages he totally forgot about. Or Probably so, because he like maybe it, it goes off the rails pretty quick. I like the Tommy knockers, but it's like, uh, here's this story. And now we're going to break into it with a random short story collection. And <laughs> two or 300 pages later, we're back to the narrative, but it, it works. It, it works in a way. So I think that's his least favorite of his, I think is what he said. I, I love the least um, favorite and, um, Lizzie's story or however you say it's his favorite. I believe that at uh, least story is, I know I've, I've read everything he's written, so I know I've read it. But honestly, like, I remember liking that one, but I truly don't remember much about it. The yeah, Tommy Knockers, I mean, for all its fault, I remember a lot about it because it's kind of a slog to get through. But now that I look <laughs> back at it, there's all these cool scenes and the structure of it is very unique. So See, I have like 90 percent of his library, but then we go back to my comment earlier 400 pages you're still yeah, going on with like this yeah. <laughs> you're still going, you're still going on with this one d describing the one scene and you <laughs> know when, when he gets it right elevation it. jay <laughs> what's that go read elevation that's like 50 pages it's i like did i did and i think I, I rated it very low when i did my yeah, review I like on it. It. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought Elevation was kind of cool. I, I'm surprised that he didn't just put that in a collection or something. Yeah, I, yeah. It was a good con. I, like we were talking about earlier, I wanted more. Like I wanted it to be longer. It was a cool concept. Yeah. I just feel like he didn't do enough with it. He does write some long books, but when he gets it right, he really gets it right. Like 
the yeah. the stand I uh, I love the stand it's my favorite book of his I'll I'll criticize the end a little bit I wanted I wanted that long walk to Vegas to lead up to something a little bit more than it did but still mm-hmm. I think it's nearly a perfect book and I love those characters and he could have written another thousand pages about those characters and I would have <laughs> I would have read it Big Salem's Lot's my favorite of his. And then the Dark Tower stuff. I love the Dark Tower. Yeah. I, I, I've i tried to get into Dark Tower. I can't get past the first book of Dark Tower. See, you you, you got to get to the, the you got to get to the third one. That's, that's, where, what I, that's what everybody says. But I mean, I don't want to jump ahead. I, I want to get through. You, you cannot the skip the first one. You can't skip right. it. Third, fourth, and fifth Dark Tower book is, uh, yeah, it's the. Yeah, the the wastelands, uh, wizard and glass, wizard and, and glass. wolves of the Kala. The, those are my favorite books in that series. It's some of my favorite stuff. But I, I also blame the show because I, every time I'm like, okay, I'm going to start reading the stuff I have, but wait, we have oh, a yeah. show coming up, so I got to read. <laughs> I got I got to try to read something of the guests we have. <laughs> I really like uh, drawing of the three. That's that one in the final book, the Dark Tower. Yeah, I don't know why. I forget. Uh, I flip flop back and forth on which is my favorite of those. I'm always disrespecting drawing of the three. I go straight it's to so the wastelands, good. but I did enjoy drawing of the three. It's, it's it's so night and day compared to the gunslinger. Like the gunslinger for me, like I didn't love it. It was okay, but then drawing of the three I was like, wow, this this is great. And it only gets better from there. So my lights shot one day. My lights flickering and my cat's meowing. So there's a, there's a ghost in there with the bitch. Is what <laughs> the cat's sensitive to the ghost. Yeah. The Scent Scene is what we're talking about. For those just joining us, it's the uh, the new novella from Mitch Seaborn, and it's a supernatural thriller. Got some schooling in it, some law. And sell it to us, Mitch, before we get out of here. Yeah, give us your, well, your elevator pitch for, yeah. for the sentencing. It's, uh, I think I put in a tweet that it's, it's everything I know about teaching and lawyering, and it's everything I know about ghosts. It's a... Uh, it's a revenge story, and uh, I like to think that there's a little bit of sincere emotion in there, too, because, I mean, it's about love and loss, and um, I'm not real good at elevator pitches, but if you're, <laughs> it works. It's, uh, it's a ghost story, yeah. ultimately, is what it is. So if you're, into, uh, if you're into ghost, if you're into being a little bit creeped out, um, but you want a little bit of that human element in there, too, All right. then... I think that's what it is. Right, right. The sentencing. We can't thank you enough for uh, wanting to uh, come back and, and Juanita, what's chat with us. Yeah, yeah. Can you show us your cat? She is he around? Is he around? Floor, I would do that. Oh, okay. All right. You're that's just, it. Put that's some, bonus content. Just I, put some pictures on X. Ghost ran her off. <laughs> <laughs> put a picture on X. <laughs> Thanks so much for wanting to hang out with us once again. I know it's been... Uh, uh, been like two years, I think. Several seasons since uh, you were with us the first time. Again, our, our seasons are, you know, whatever we decide to make. Hey, them. you guys yeah. have had some good guests on here. So I'm uh like after after my show, uh, you were getting some really talented writers on here. So I'm oh, just dude. honored. You're you're a talented writer, Mitch. I'm I'm honored to be share the airspace of you know the the two guys that have talked to, you know, Ross Jeffrey <laughs> and some it's like it's yeah. like we we'll send out an email to like you know, 500 and get three back. I'm like, okay, we got the next three shows. I'm kidding. <laughs> no. So, and uh, yeah, thanks to everybody that's read this book and is going to read it. And uh, you know, the, the best way to support a writer, I don't care if it's somebody that is independently published or published by random house uh, reviews and word of mouth are a writer's best friend. So there no better is. way to support them. That's uh, probably the best way to uh, to end it. Yeah, way to support a writer. Pick up the sentencing. It's good. Yeah. It's quick read. It's ghost story. There's a band in town. Can't go wrong. Yeah. It, you it, gotta it, pick it, up the other ones that have Riley Saunders in them. You gotta get her whole story. You gotta pick, you gotta get all three books. Yeah, she, she uh, writes the uh, the eeriness. I, I so that's yeah. pretty cool. So yeah. All right, Mitch. Thanks so much for hanging out, Mitch. Seaboard, enjoyed, everyone. Yeah. For everyone in the chat, thanks. Paper Cuts is back. We got another episode next week, I believe, right? Yeah, Brad? Virginia Keeper. Yes. Uh, yeah. This Wretched Valley, her debut comes out on Tuesday, I believe. So we've I'm glad you that. guys are back and doing today. this. Yep. We had to take a little a, uh, like an holiday. Hiatus. I don't know if it was unattended. We talked about taking some time off. So. Well, we also talked about, well, we're going to have like six shows in these holiday months and like 
the kids had like back to back to back fall festivals yeah. every other day and christmas parties every other day it was like there's just no time i mean anything. i would have been doing it from my car driving the kids around yeah like here's a camera <laughs> yeah. so yeah, yeah it's been was... it's been busy here too i understand this this time of year we just got out of is uh right. it's busy it's busy mm -hmm. yeah you're a teacher so yeah you know i feel like there was a fall festival every other day yeah <laughs> christmas party every other day and they had to do christmas course some, some of the some of the things day. we didn't even know about in advance it was like oh my oldest would be like yeah. oh i have a choir thing tonight yeah they'll really? tell you like <laughs> shoot the okay. school sends you an email like a day before by the yeah. way we have this concert tomorrow like so oh yeah we, we have a, a a prep band tonight oh, yeah <laughs> i just went last night why couldn't they do it all everything in one night so all right that's a wrap guys we're, thanks we're, for joining we're back us now we're back so yeah all right i know everyone everyone does this a whole bunch <laughs> for uh Bradford over there i'm jay thanks mitch so much uh that's it that's a wrap that's the way the cookie crumbles all right. Guys. See ya. See you guys. Bye -bye. Love you, Jay. I know you do. <laughs>